Thank you, Melissa. Today, this webinar is going to summarize the work just completed to investigate researcher identifiers. The report itself can be considered an executive summary of the research documented in supplementary data sets, which are also available for download at the link shown here. First, an overview of the challenges we are all facing. There are three university rankings issued annually, rankings that are of particular importance to research libraries. Some universities even incorporate raising their ranking in their strategic plans. All three use citations as a factor in determining the rankings and, and puts added weight to authors of journal articles, which are usually not represented in national authority files. Now, Noam Chomsky is a scholar widely translated. WorldCat has records for his works in 50 languages, but only some of the forms of the name are represented as preferred forms in national authority files shown on the left. The forms on the right are all from Wikidata, and only a few of them are even supported in national authority files. Uh, <clears throat> most of the ones that are represented are represented by in these scripts with romanizations only. Note the N. Chemsky, sorry, note, uh, Note that N. Chomsky form used in journal articles is generally not included in national authority files. This one was contributed by ISNI. Chomsky happens to have a rather unique name, but for many forms it would be a challenge to match up the abbreviated journal citation form with the fuller form of the name. This illustrates the futility of relying on text string matching to determine if two authors represent the same person or not. Now, Michael Conlon is a member of our task group, an expert in biomedial informatics at the University of Florida. There is another Michael Conlon in the UK who writes articles on European taxes, obviously two different people. Then there's this article on microbiota in the Australian journal Microbiology, also written by a Michael Conlon, the same Michael Conlon as the University of Florida one, or a different one based in Australia. Without other metadata, it is difficult to tell. Turns out it is yet another Michael Conlon, and Michael Conlon says there's several others in his field. Now, Michael Conlon is a relatively uncommon name, but consider that in China, 275 million people have the surname of Li, Wang, or Zhang, and that's not including millions of overseas Chinese. The chances of ethnic Chinese having the same name, especially in the abbreviated form used in journal articles, is very high. We need other identifying attributes such as institutional affiliation and discipline, if not photos, to disambiguate names. Now, some researchers already have multiple identifiers. This is an example from a signature block in an email. The researcher includes 12 different identifiers or profiles he's represented in. This also fragments his web presence. To recap the challenges, citations are a factor in assessing the impact of scholarship but journal article authors often are not represented in authority files. A given scholar can be represented by different forms of a name, all of which we may not be included in authority files and cannot be matched accurately by string matching alone. Two or more researchers may have the same name and we need other attributes to disambiguate them. And some researchers already have multiple identifiers. These are the members of the OCLC Research Registering Researchers and Authority Files Task Group, which I facilitated. The members represent different perspectives from three countries, the U.S., the Netherlands, and the U.K. We have members who are librarians who contribute to the LC NACO Authority File or train others to do so, and who are members of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging. We have ORCID and ISNI board members and representatives from BIVO, a current research information system, and a publisher. My colleague, Tom Hickey, is the chief scientist responsible for creating the virtual international authority file and is on both the VF Council and an ORCID board. The first thing the task group did was write up 18 use case scenarios from the perspective of six different actors or stakeholders, researcher, funder, university administrator, librarian, identity management system, and an aggregator including publishers. I've consolidated the needs identified here. Some overlap. For example, the need to disambiguate names is common to several stakeholders. We started with a list of over 100 different research information identifier systems, and we used two criteria to select the systems to profile. One, have significant mind share or take up by researchers, 
and two, researchers are represented by a persistent, unique, and publicly accessible URI. We wanted to end up with a representative sample of different we wanted to end up with a representative sample of different research information identifier systems. For some system types, we profiled only one system to represent a category. We've extrapolated now. So, how many researchers are there? Uh, we've extrapolated from World Bank statistics that the total number of researchers worldwide was nine million in 2012. We can't tell where all of those researchers are. We do know that there is one. No, there is no one system that includes all researchers. Although both name authority files and researcher identifier systems both represent researchers by persistent and unambiguous identifiers, researcher identifier systems include researchers cited in journal articles who have received grants or have created data, data sets, all of which may not be represented in authority files. In addition, authority files provide a preferred label for the researchers based on the community they serve while identifier systems are agnostic about forms of names. There are overlaps. Here, Lorcan Dempsey's VF cluster shows he is represented in 16 national authority files, as well as by a Wikipedia article and the ISNI database. My OCLC colleague, Eric Childress, has an authority record with his ISNI, ORCID, and VF identifiers. The same information about a, a specific researcher may be represented in multiple databases, and only a subset interoperates with each other. We've diagrammed the flow of information describing researchers and identified researcher outputs such as publications among classes of actors and systems. Each category of actor is depicted with an icon and a caption. An arrow going from one entity to another is used to indicate that information flows from one entity to the other. So this researcher identifier information flow di diagram here reveals several patterns. First, the information flow is quite a complex overall, especially between public aggregators and private aggregators. Second, most of the information flow is one way. There are few automatic or systematic channels for corrections or annotations at later stages to flow back up to the public aggregator sources or to the actors providing them. ISNI, which focuses on managing links between member identifier systems and databases, is an exception. It tracks all sources and corrections are fed back to the source as they are made. The interoperability flows between ISNI and ISNI registration agencies and between ISNI and VF are indicated in the diagram by bidirectional arrows. Many actors are contributing to multiple public views of researcher ID information. Fourth, information provided by the same class of actors may flow through multiple, possibly concurrent paths to internal aggregator systems and public views, suggesting the potential for duplication and inconsistency. And finally, individual categories of public views seldom represent more than one type of internal aggregator. A key question is how corrections or updates can be communicated between systems. Researchers are frustrated when they see errors in their profiles, works incorrectly assigned to them, or works missing. Even if the information is corrected in the local instance, it often is not reflected in the aggregated databases or hubs. In brief, there is no one system that includes all researchers, nor meets all the functional requirements of all stakeholders. Assigning persistent identifiers to researchers early in their careers will help both researchers and their institutions compile their scholarly output more comprehensively and accurately. We are now going to hear from four of the task group members, each with a different perspective. Laura Dawson is Product Manager Identifier Systems at Bowker, focusing on ISNI, ISBN, and web-related identifiers and standards in the book value chain. Andrew McEwen is Head of Content and Metadata Processing at the British Library and has been involved in authority control over networked databases. He is a board member of the ISNI International Agency and BL's representative on the Program for Cooperative Cataloging's Policy Committee. Philip Skur is the new interim head of technical services at Stanford University and is focused on the transition of all technical services workflows to linked data as the next logical infrastructure to engage and embed library data in the semantic web. 
And Daniel Hook is co-founder of Symplectic Limited, a research information management system, director of research metrics at Digital Science, and interim chief operating officer at Figshare. He holds visiting academic positions at, at Imperial College in London, as well as the University of Washington in St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Laura. Great. Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about <coughs> um, IDNI and um, how we're using it at Bowker, how publishers are using it, um, and uh, a little bit about the structure of ISNI as well and how it works. So um, what is ISNI? We'll, we'll start there. Um, <clears throat> it's an ISO standard. It was published in 2012. It's part of the same family of standards as the ISBN and the ISSN and the DOI. Um, ISNI stands for International Standard Name Identifier. And it's a numerical represent representation of a name. So it's 16 digits long. Um, and it, uh, it really does solve the problem of having uh, names rendered in, in multiple languages and multiple character sets. Um, it's assigned to contributors of content. So that includes researchers, but also authors, musicians, actors, publishers, and research institutions. And <clears throat> it's assigned to subjects of that content if they're people or institutions. So the founding members of ISNI are um, a number of rights organizations and some library organizations. Um, IFRO, um, which manages <coughs> reproduction, reproduction rights organizations, um, CSAC, which is mostly concerned with um, music rights, SCOPR, which is primarily concerned with actors and, and other performers' rights, um, OCLC, who everybody presumably knows, um, CENL, and uh, they're represented by the British Library and the National Library of France, um, and ProQuest, uh, which is represented by Bowker. The organizational structure uh, is pretty intricate. Um, we've got a board of directors and then um, the ISNI assignment agency, which in this case is OCLC. Um, there's a quality team that includes the British Library, uh, the French National Library, as well as uh, La Trobe University. They just became a member of the quality team. Um, registration agencies include Bowker and Ringgold, as well as uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, um, who just became a registration agent this year. Um, and then we have a variety of members, including digital science, um, and I, I know we'll hear a little bit more from that perspective a little bit later. Um, the registration agencies are responsible for ongoing assignments and dealing with the uh, general public, so individuals who want to apply for ISNIs for their own names. So basically the way it works is a publisher will submit a file of names for assignment through a registration agency. Um, the registration agency works with the publisher to make sure that the data feed meets all the criteria that the assignment agency needs in order to make the assignments. Um, the assignment agency assigns as many ISNIs to the names in the feed that it can. Um, <clears throat> the assignment agency uses a very complex series of algorithms and business rules that continue to evolve with each successive feed. Um, and the assignment agency then returns a file of names with ISNIs attached to them. And this may not be the full file of names. Ambiguous names are held for review by the quality team, so they are manually reviewed and researched. Um, quality team assignments and other exceptions um, are returned to the registration agent quarterly. Um, so the process is not terribly transactional. It's not instant. Assignment may be immediate if the name and other information is unique, but frequently assignments can take a week or more. So just to recap, the publisher submits data to the registration agent. Registration agent sends the file to the assignment agent. Assignment agency assigns as many ISNIs to the names as it can. Then the assignment agency sends the assigned file back to the registration agency. The registration agency disperses that assigned file to the publishers who review and QA and ingest the files. And then there's an update process for all those ISNIs that are continuing to be researched and, and need more information before they can be assigned. So the assignment agency sends updates on a quarterly basis. The registration agency disperses those files to the appropriate publishers and the publishers ingest the updates. 
In terms of what gets displayed in the uh, ISNI public database, only minimal metadata is displayed because it's really not meant as a comprehensive profile. It's a tool for linking data sets, for co-location, for disambiguation. Um, enhancements to the record can be made if the contributor wants, but it's not required. So here's a sample of a public ISNI record. It happens to be mine, and I keep it sparse on purpose just to bring home this, the, uh, <clears throat> the notion that it doesn't have to be complete. Um, in fact, it doesn't list anything I've written, even though I've written quite a number of things. Um, but uh, there's enough information here where my ISNI can be assigned. So ISNI embedded in various data sets is a way of linking these data sets together. Uh, it serves as a, a bridge identifier. Um, so in this way, uh, Wikidata can be linked to books in print. Books in print can be linked to ORCID because ORCID is using ISNIs uh, to identify research institutions. Um, books in print can be linked to VIOF. It can be linked to the British Library. Um, ProQuest databases are starting to use ISNIs now. Um, so uh, those databases will be interoperable with many other data sets as well. So this is a pretty um, uh, exciting way of joining up a lot of data and uh, participating in, in the semantic web. So who's using ISNIs? Um, as I mentioned, Wikidata, VIOF, Access Copyright. Um, the ProQuest products, Community of Scholars, Pivot, um, are using them. Um, Music Brains, Digital Science, um, and we're piloting at Bowker with BookNet Canada and the Authors Guild. This is an example of an ISNI sort of in the wild. Um, this is Einstein's Wikipedia page, and in the uh, authority control section down at the very bottom of his page, um, you see he, there's his VIOF ID, the LCCN, um, and the ISNI. The ISNI is a link. If you click on it, it takes you to the um, uh, ISNI page for Einstein. Um, how many names do we have so far? We have over 8 million ISNIs assigned to the names in the database. Um, there are an additional 10 million names awaiting a match from another data set for further corroboration or awaiting further research. Um, ISNIs are assigned on behalf of contributors, so it may well be that your author names um, have ISNIs already. It's always worthwhile to go check at isni.org slash search. So it's not a self-claiming system necessarily. It can be, but it's, it, it's not meant to be that. Um, the way publishers are using ISNIs um, is, well, this is an example of uh, the Random House website. Um, we've got two theologians. Um, or possibly one, we don't know. James Emery White could be the same as James White. It could be um, an error in the metadata on these records, or it could be two separate people. They both write about theology, so they both serve in the same domain, um, and we just, we just don't know. So um, having separate ISNIs or having a single ISNI that co-locates these two names would be very helpful, especially when it comes to assigning royalties. Um, another very valuable use case is cross-domain linking. As I mentioned, ISNI serves as a bridge identifier uh, between multiple data sets. So if you've got someone like Brian May, who is a very multi-talented person, he's got information in a multitude of, of data sets. Um, looking at all of his contributions, you see he's got this uh, scientific, um, uh, it's actually his, his uh, astrophysics dissertation. Um, He's also got uh, a collection of stereoscopic photographs because he collects them and he's an expert in that field too. Um, he also happens to be the guitarist for the rock band Queen. So um, if you are using multiple data sets and you want to find comprehensive information about Brian May, the ISNI is a great way of connecting all of this disparate data into a single environment. Um, I mentioned the data quality team. Um, this is uh, based on matching names to existing records in the database, so we have over 18 million names. Um, there are very strict criteria for initial assignment. Uh, the quality team is extremely attentive and makes a lot of manual edits to records, so uh, the British Library, the National Library of France, and La Trobe University uh, are the current members of the quality team. 
Uh, there is a common surname list that we begin with. Um, if the name is on the common surname list, if it's like Smith or Jones or you or you know what have you, um, we require a birth date, a death date if it's relevant, um, any ISBNs or ISSNs or DOIs or any other um, uh, identifiers to uh, works that that person has contributed to, as well as the titles of those works, and any co-authors or institutional affiliation, any relation to any other public entity is uh, probably going to guarantee assignment. If it is not on the common surname list, um, and of course that's, uh, that's quite a, a lot, um, we just require a title, a birth date, uh, a possible death date, and any other distinguishing factors like this um, Richard Chasov is not this other Ricardo Chasova. Uh, not that that would be really possible, but that's the best example I could come up with on the fly. Um, if the name is unique and does not exist in the ISNI database yet, then we have immediate assignment. So all the text matching takes place on the uh, assignment agency side. Um, so now I think I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Okay, thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've, the title of mine is very much focused around NACO and the future of authority control with a subline that why is the BL working with ISNI? Um, and I was asked to sort of try and provide a national library perspective on the whole question of getting research into authority files. And so our starting point in um, the British Library is library authority control, and library authority control for us means the NACO file. So, oh, hold on, I'm not getting the, oh, there we are. So what I'm going to talk about is something about our experiences um, with authority control, some strategic discussions that are going on with the program for cooperative cataloging about the future of authority control, I will also talk about the actual plans that are, are now in hand for the diffusion of ISNIs into the NACO authority file and the plans that we will have for maintaining um, and managing those identity links once they're first established and how we will go about extending ISNI assignment into NACO. And then beyond that, I want to talk a little bit about ISNI models for cooperation. And I particularly want to focus on some BL experiences in the, the researcher environment with theses and articles. And I'll conclude with some reflections and questions about what could ISNI be in relation to um, replacing or supplementing NACO as a new way of working and positioning and integrating library data into a global um, data network. So just Last week, um, the PCC Policy Committee was holding some strategic discussions about um, the future of the various programs of cooperative cataloging, but there were some specific discussions around name authorities. How do we reach, how do we extend the reach of the uh, name authority file? How, does, how do we get more non-NACO members to start to participate? Can there be things like a sort of NACO light, non-cataloging non based version of authorities that are good identities but not necessarily conformant to NACO and RDA rules for constructing headings? Or should we have more interaction with local authority files? And I think it sums up that it's a, it's a bit of how do we get more done um, with the resources that we've got? So these are some of the questions going into the strategic discussions, and I think the strategic directions coming out were very much firming those questions into the direction of how do we actually integrate NACO authorities into the global data ecosystem, and how do we move in terms of our mindset away from authority control and control of strings to actual management of identities. So I'm trying to contextualize how I think NACO sits in the, the global um, data infrastructure at the moment. And, and I think you could say it is not highly integrated into the sort of global web of data. There are lots and lots of different ID systems and databases. And NACO is firmly based in the world of books and libraries and those things that we've actually had the resources to control in our catalogs. It is becoming more networked, though, 
and it is networked certainly well through the, the VIAF enterprise, which makes it far more international, so it's got broader scope um, in the library world, but it's still within that, that bookish-based world of, of interconnectivity. So the question that I'm facing is, is ISNI a potential answer to a problem that needs to be solved? That how do you actually make, make your library data and your authorities better integrated into the, the broader global web of data? And this diagram really just is trying to focus that ISNI is intended to be an identifier hub. And these are the, some of the databases that are currently being linked by ISNI. So ISNI is an identifier that's assigned, but it's therefore linked to other identifiers that are held in all these different namespaces that you see here. And as Laura has already said, there are 8 million identities already assigned. But behind that, perhaps more importantly, there are 21 million links between IDs in this network. And that's not counting um, all the, the, the links within VIAF. Within the, with is the universe, our, our estimate of 20 million links still treats VIAF as a single link. But actually within VIAF, there are, there are dozens and dozens of links on different identities. Further behind that, as Laura was saying, it's, it's not just about the identifiers itself, it's about data sets. So we've estimated that there are about 80 million works associated with identities in the uh, ISNI database at the present. So what are our plans for diffusion into NACA? Um, well, we now have an agreed schedule. Um, some tests will be going on in the new year. But the plan is that we will do a massive um, reboot of the whole NACO file. There will be some changes associated with RDA, but part of that will also be an upload of, at the last estimate, between 3 and 4 million ISNIs that had currently been matched within the ISNI database to corresponding LC record identities from the NACO file. Um, so that figure may have grown by the time we're actually doing it next year for real. Um, once that's done, we have an issue of it's not just a one-off thing. We have to keep having updates and ongoing maintenance. So we already have established mechanisms for those people that are actively working with ISNI. Um, we do have monthly inter updates coming back from VIAF. And as has already been outlined, we have a process around quality control and the activities of the quality team. And we pick up and, and send back um, ISNIs and error notifications where appropriate. And what I'm really trying to get across here is that we have a plan, we have a system and an infrastructure for actually managing the relationship between the identities that will come from NACO and their corresponding ISNI um, link. And if you think that's just what we're doing for the NACO file, that's what ISNI has to do for all sources and all data contributors if it's going to fulfill its work in actually maintaining the integrity of the ISNI as an, an, a sort of hub identifier linking other, other identifiers. So how, do we, how will we go about extending ISNI assignment in NACO? Well, there will be ongoing batch processes as new data sets are added to the ISNI database. They naturally act as a kind of glue. More works get into there. More information gets into there that enhances the metadata about the identities that are already in there. And those can create the possibility of more links to existing data that's within the file. So there's a constant um, process of deduplication and um, potential ISNIs becoming upgraded to actual assigned ISNIs as the confidence level and the, the volume of metadata that supports the assertion that this person is the same as that person um, allows an ISNI to be assigned through the algorithm systems. But there will be a long tail of manual assignment as well. And the question there is, how do we do that? And I think it's a question of, do NACO members want to begin to take part in ISNI? Do they have their own specific targeted projects, perhaps related to their own institutions, where they may actually begin on a smaller scale to sort of contribute their NACO work, 
but actually integrate it with Disney work as well, so that they're actually working in, into more of a, a linked data environment as part of the normal process of authority control. Which brings me on to the idea of ISNI as providing models for cooperation. And I'm going to focus just on the library sector, but of course there are lots of other people working within the ISNI ecosystem itself, so it's not just about what libraries are sharing. But I, I picked up this quote that was, um, was in an article somewhere back in the early 90s, around the time the program for cooperative cataloging was, was set up and the various programs and components of the program were, were established. And I think this, this basic contention that, that there is a burden of effort and however you share it out, it's there. It, has, it is work to be done and it will not go away. I think that remains true. I think it's probably a bigger effort now to try and um, work in a, a world of linked data with all the possibilities that, that that creates, but all the problems it creates because the actual scale of what you're trying to control and provide better access to and understand you know, where research is being done and how it's being done and who's doing it and who's working with whom, all of those things are just a much bigger problem that is way beyond the scope of traditional name authorities. But potentially, managing identities and links can be a problem shared much more widely than ever before. And I think that could be partly the programmers that, that build the algorithm-based systems for doing assignments and matching of data between one database and another, to registration agencies interacting with publishers and other other sort of interested parties, to direct members who have their own data to bring, and to end user input, because we do allow um, for end user input into any record on the ISNI system, so we can get feedback which will go to the quality team. So moving on to some British Library experiences. Um, one subset of data that we work on in British Library is the provision and cataloging of um, catalog data for British theses um, submitted from different parts of, of the higher education sector in, in the UK. We've been doing this for several decades. It's now um, become an online service in the ethos system, um, but we've, we've been cataloging these things for a long time and we continue to catalog um, as many theses are sent to us for, for processing um, every year. We've managed to submit these through to the ISNI system, and we did that because we don't put these um, records through authority control. It was kind of an extra um, sideline from our main mainstream cataloging processes, and it was done as a service for, for the UK HE sector to provide access to theses. Um, we now have um, close on 75,000 assigned ISNIs through the data matching algorithms and we're working on different um, collaborative sort of ideas with the assignment system at, at OCLC to think of ways that we can increase automatic assignment. However, we haven't yet loaded these into the ethos system. We're hoping that will happen in the next few months. And we will then be progressing plans to look at integrating an ISNI lookup and an assignment process into our normal cataloging procedures for theses in the future, and we will do that as an ISNI registration agency, so change our status from just part of the quality team and a founding member to actually actively working and providing a service. And when we do that, we would like to work um, and get a clearer understanding of the collaboration with ORCID, because one thing that we have a commitment to do with ORCID through a memorandum of understanding that we we signed with them last January is that we need to find a way of making our IDs interoperate and this might be one place in which we're both going to be capturing identities very early in, in their lifetime um, who will go on to continue to research. So another um, data set that was of much interest to us was um, our electronic table of contents service. Um, that is created within the BL and that we have submitted from that um, a data set of about 30 million articles representing about 90 million different author lines all not disambiguated in any way whatsoever they just as is as found in the articles 
and we have so far managed to assign through the standard data matching algorithms um, close to a quarter of a million ISNIs. Uh, again, we're pending load into our in-house system and uh, exposure on Primo. One of the points of interest for doing this is actually Primo because Primo already exposes all our article metadata. So we have those 90 million author lines within our article metadata as search access points alongside our well-controlled, authority-controlled bibliographic databases. So you can imagine the amount of background noise and impact on search and results that all of those uncontrolled names have against the smaller pool of controlled names that's the, the mainstream catalogues. There is ongoing research in Leiden that's looking at ways of improving clustering of articles and doing more data mining approaches. So moving away from just the data matching algorithms to actually developing more sophisticated ways of clustering articles and authors and potentially assigning IDs. Uh, we haven't yet done any work on the quality team to review any of that work as yet. So I would imagine that this will we will want to continue improving and extending assignment to articles because it's a really valuable area of, of um, exposing access to research and researchers and their output. Um, but I imagine it's always going to be largely batch processed with a, a small amount of um, quality review and assessment. It's not something we would ever be able to integrate manually as we think we can for theses. So moving on to another example, and this is a non BL example, and this is La Trobe University. And they've contributed just over 3,500 records into the ISNI system. And if you take this as a kind of parallel of scale that you might get from a NACO institution working in its contributions to the NACO authority shared file, um, here is a situation where about half of the records were able to be assigned automatically through matching algorithms. The rest have been flagged as provisional and are steadily being worked through as um, they manage to get all of them assigned. And I think their goal is to have the whole lot assigned with ISNIs and integrated into the ISNI system with their crosslinks to NACO, VIAF, as you can see in the crosslinks at the bottom of this screen. Um, so you can see the kind of effect that um, you can do something that's very like normal name authority control, but because it's about managing identities, you're actually building it into an interlinked, um, cross-linked, networked environment straight away. And I've already mentioned ORCID. I should probably give them a li little bit more focus here. Um, how we're going to try to link ORCID and ISNI IDs, we're going to try and develop more and more pilot projects and ways in which we actually just do the work in practical terms. So we're really looking for those opportunities. And we have institutions that are like La Trobe that have started with ISNIs but would like to get ORCIDs. There are other institutions that are starting with ORCIDs but would like to have the cross links to ISNIs. There is an API lookup from ORCID, so end users that have an ORCID can actually get ISNIs, and some have done that. And we can also provide institutional IDs um, to support um, disambiguation in the ORCID data set. We think the two models are complementary. We're very much about um, dealing with large data sets, batch assignment, linking up and bridging data silos. And the ORCID model is about getting it's bridging the final data silo, which is getting the link back to the researchers themselves and having their engagement so that they're actually engaged in the management and use of their own ID. And we think that's a hugely powerful um, story that comes from the ORCID side, which would be great if we can actually be better interlinked between ORCID and ISNI. So I'll just wrap up on a final couple of slides. For the BL, Clearly, we have made our commitments, and we've joined the board of ISNI, and we have a, a strong sense that ISNI is a potential strategic goal and a way forward for how to do authorities that can't be covered by NACO. And that's where we focused our efforts initially. Is you know we would once we get the ISNI into the NACO file, it then creates other questions about how we integrate ISNI more fully into our workflows. And that's a question that the Bibliothèque Nationale is already addressing because they have done just that. They have ISNI within their authorities and their bibliographic files, so they can now start to think, what does that mean for their, their ordinary 
day-to-day -day workflows. But we're a young organization. There's a long way to go. And I think what we need is more libraries to actually see if this cooperative model um, can start to answer the questions about how does ISME and NACO interact and work together? And do they just continue to live side by side with slightly different emphasis about which each is doing? I do know that more national libraries are, are rapidly starting to join ISME, and, and they will start to have an impact and probably extend the membership of the quality team as well. So I think I just wanted to finish by saying I think what we have from ISNI is a sustainable infrastructure. It could be better. It can grow. And we can hopefully get um, more done the more members that we get. And that is the path that we're now on. And I think, as um, Karen was mentioning in the initial introduction, one of the strengths is that we do track and use the sources of all the data elements so that we can report and maintain integrity and diffuse corrections as, as well as diffuse the original ISNIs. So I think it's now time for me to hand over to Phil. Great. Uh, thank you so much, um, Andrew. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit now on this perspective of this question uh, from the point of view of an individual research library. There's been a tremendous shift towards putting our library data on the web, but this approach, I think, is becoming far too simplistic. Often, we approach this by making our materials simply available to the web. But the web doesn't understand our data or its semantics, and it ends up by being used just simply as free text. We must shift our mindset to learning to embed our data into the web, not just making it available to the web. Developments in the last number of years, such as schema.org and Bibframe, are allowing us to finally encode our data in such a way that the web can understand its semantics. Academic libraries, as the home of many of the researchers with which we're concerned here, have data that is particularly rich in semantics and have a big stake in how their data is absorbed into the web, both internally for its faculty and staff, but more and more how its data can be successfully integrated into data from other research libraries. One key change in thinking will be a shift from authorities to identifiers. In our traditional cataloging work, we have focused on the creation of unique text strings to differentiate the researchers that surface in our cataloging. As we shift towards creating web-friendly linked data to represent these entities, two basic changes must occur in what we do. First, there needs to be a shift from the creation of authorities as text strings to a representation of the researcher themselves as in a FOF or schema.org person. Second, there needs to be a shift from the requirement of the creation of a complex authority record to the rapid assignment of an identifier. But where is the pressure to assign all these identifiers coming from? In the past, our metadata departments have focused on the cataloging of monographs, and we have been more or less successful in creating authorities for a high percentage of these authors. But as our portfolios explode with the need to manage authors of articles, that is, all those researchers that we've been talking about, and besides that, anything else the university decides to throw at us, this labor-intensive process of authority record creation will have to be modified. By shifting to the use of identifiers, we solve the double dilemma of needing to make our data more web-friendly and being able to create these control structures expeditiously. A great example at Stanford for this exploding role in identity management is Sally, or the Stanford All Image Exchange. And uh, Sally has been named after the Stanford's racehorse, whose name was Sally. 
at least 200 Stanford departments, as well as the university photographer, take part in this image exchange. The photographs may include any number of inanimate objects, such as buildings here on campus, which also change over the years, but also include a great number of faculty and departmental guests. That is, all those researchers from Stanford and other institutions that we are trying to register. There has been no systematic control over the headings used for the people and the buildings in these photographs. And the group that runs Sally has recently come to Stanford's metadata department as the place where linked data is taking off to take control of all this metadata. So in the past, all the departments have done is simply create tags for anything that they see in the photograph. Um, and so there is a wide variety of terms that are actually used and also a wide variety of things which they decide to tag. So it makes sense that they would come to the metadata department to put all these pl um, places and people under control, but it has tremendously increased the amount of work that the metadata, has to, metadata department has to do to exert that control. Another great example is the growing CAP network at Stanford or the Stanford profiles. The CAP network is a virtual workplace. Um, it was originally developed by the School of Medicine uh, to support their faculty, graduate students, and postdocs. Um, it will create a profile of that person. It also uh, includes all of their publications, which they can either can be automatically harvested or they can actually add them themselves or have their admins add it for them. Um, and it allows them to associate with each other by area of research interest or publication interest. Uh, recently, Stanford has decided to expand this out from the School of Medicine to the entire part of the university. And they have begun with the library at first, uh, but then also the School of Medicine and Engineering and a number of the other departments within the university. But of course, for this program to work, each of those faculty members needs to have an identifier uh, set up for them in order to have all this linking take place. Now the library has considered various methods of identification, but in the end we will be assigning a local identifier which can be used for each of these faculty members in something that we'll, we will be calling uh, the Stanford Authority File. Again, there will be a need for speed here. In order for the system to work, each faculty member would need to have that identifier assigned immediately. In many ways, we'd like to put them through the same NACO process that we have used for our monographic authors, but the amount of names that we would have to control is just simply far too uh, great for us to be able to put through this process. And that brings me to my final slide, and that is reconciliation. So identifiers may be easy to assign, but there is little doubt that the same research, researcher has the strong possibility of being assigned multiple identifiers, both within and across institutions. And this, of course, defeats the whole purpose of having an identifier in the first place. So this is why I think of this process that we'll be engaging in as semi-linked data. So it will be useful in that we can link together all of a person's identities here at Stanford itself, but that is not the same thing as being able to merge their identifiers uh, worldwide and all the various systems that include that um, exist. So uh, reconciliation uh, would be able to merge those multiple identifiers for the same researcher into one master identifier, finally closing that break in the partial link. But this engine has yet to be developed for researcher identifiers at this level. Services such as VF do a great job in reconciling traditional catalog data, which is based in monographic cataloging. But something new is needed to reconcile this growing sea of researcher identifiers. And to me, that is going to be the real place that we need to focus our attention uh, in the next year or so. And uh, with that, I will turn over the presentation to Daniel for his part.
Thank you, Philip. So I've been asked to give a perspective from a research information management system provider. And that's inherently um, partially an institutional perspective, but also a perspective from the uh, point of view of a researcher. And so thinking about this initially from an institutional perspective, it's kind of interesting to think about the various drivers that institutions have which might lead them to uh, need identifiers. And broadly speaking, there are identifiers that we need not just at a personal level, but also at an institutional level, uh, at the level of papers and publications, research outputs. And so there's actually a whole plethora of different identifiers that we need to concern ourselves with as an institution. There's a great diversity of, of different stakeholders exerting pressure on us as an institution to hold these identifiers and to be able to disambiguate and have confidence in our data, which is essentially what the role of the identifier is playing for us. In the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, we all have uh, different government mandates which are coming, uh, which are handed down to us in terms of understanding the quality of our research and reporting to the taxpayer on the nature of the research that we're doing. And in order to make that process as efficient as possible, that does mean that we have to have unique identifiers for all sorts of uh, outputs of research and the researchers themselves. If we think about uh, recent moves with government, uh, with funder mandates, uh, I think this is pretty much now a global phenomenon where funders are requiring data to be reported back to them. We're seeing open data coming out of institutions. We're seeing open access requirements on institutions. And all of these requirements uh, are broadly around serving the taxpayer, serving the people paying for the research, are increasing the data requirements that institutions have to deal with. And consequently, the systems that are, in, are enabling these data to be collected need to have an enhanced level of metadata and an enhanced level of identification in order for us to be efficient about reporting these various outputs to the different stakeholders. These are relatively new uh, drivers in the whole space. Some of the older drivers are really around competition and collaboration. Where Karen started the uh, presentation was really around university rankings. And certainly in terms of institutions being able to efficiently benchmark themselves against other institutions, the ability to have unique identifiers, again, around papers, institutions, and people are the key three types of identifier that we need in any kind of system so that we can actually track this with efficiency and be able to compare ourselves. Of course, the flip side of analyzing the competition is understanding who your collaborators could be. If you discover that there are people who are good at things that you're not particularly good at, but work in a similar area, there's an opportunity to work with them. Knowing where those people are situated, understanding with some level of confidence what it is they've been involved with, these are all uh, things that we seek to do in a more automated way now. There are now so many researchers and so many institutions doing interesting work that having uh, centralized indices where we can locate people and standardized search systems where we can have confidence in the data, it's a real driver for what institutions are looking to try and achieve now. Of course, as time goes on, we are actually seeing a richer vein of data in the area as well. 10 years ago, we would have looked at a space where research management and research information management wasn't terribly professional. It was actually a bunch of people who had come out of research and who were very starting the very earliest uh, attempts at systematizing research management and putting uh, research management on a professional be uh, footing. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a massive professionalization of research information management. And that's meant that we've moved from just collecting publications data, citations data, data about people, to actually much larger um, ambitions in this area. So we've started thinking about what grants we are, we're winning. We've started thinking about what patents we're winning. We've started thinking about the impact of our research. 
And uh, as I show on this slide, we've started getting interested in some of the nuances around what we're producing, what's available for open access, what type of data are we making available for reproducibility of results. Uh, we start thinking about the attention associated with our research. Um, in terms of tweets and blog articles, there's a much wider world of information that we're now interested in. And in that wider world that we're trying to access, uh, it's, it's now becoming very difficult to work out the signal-to-noise ratio effectively. What stuff is actually meaningful to us and what stuff is, is, is garbage? Um, a very good example actually is in the case of, um, of mining Twitter to signal about uh, papers and finding out what papers are trending in the public mind. Without digital object identifiers, DOIs associated with papers, there would, it would be extremely difficult to find any signal in what's talked about with papers. And URLs are the same in this respect, but we have a variety of different identifiers that we can now track on a paper level. The same is not universally true of people. Last year, a colleague of mine, Jonathan Adams, wrote an interesting article that appeared in Nature about the nature of research itself, and he called into um, the fourth age of research. And he considers the first age of research to be research that happens on your own as an individual. In that particular situation, you're not particularly worried about the institutional um, and personal identifiers for your own ends. You might be interested in it in terms of your um, marketing your research effectively, but you're not so interested in it in terms of communicating your research. The second age uh, of, of uh, research is research happening at an institutional level. Again, an institution is now starting to think about how to track research internally, and it's starting to work out what it's producing for the uh, money that it's putting in and the grants that it's winning. With the third age of research, we saw research starting to happen at a national level. And already, this gets to incredible levels of complexity. You now have situations where grant funding is being allocated to multiple institutions. And typically, there'll be a lead institution. But you now have to worry about who are the people who are associated with that grant. What's the data that's being produced from the grant? Which are the papers being produced from the grant? You have to understand and be able to report back to the funder. You have to report to each of the individual universities. And now the data is starting to get complex. With the fourth stage of research, we have international research. In fact, the project that we're currently involved with, the run by OCLC, in this case that we're reporting on, is a piece of international research. And actually tracking people internationally and working out who owns the outputs of the research uh, where funding is going and flowing around the world is even more challenging. And in fact, national systems of identification start to become troublesome and start to break down. Funder-based uh, identification systems that operate within single funders start to become problematic because it becomes very difficult to understand uh, which funders are funding which areas in which countries. If the money appears to be going to one particular research institution but then is disseminated out across a number of different institutions within a collaboration, it's very, this is something that's very difficult to track without being able to track the researchers who are associated with the grant and the papers that are coming out of the grant. A really fascinating uh, development in this space has actually come from the University of uh, California at San Francisco, where they have now created an open proposal system. I think this really goes to underline the whole idea that research is becoming more collaborative, that in order to know what's going on and really understand the space, we have to have unique identifiers that allow us to make assertions about people where we understand where the assertion has come from, really going to the heart of open, linked open data. The open proposal system at UCSF allows uh, people to put up proposals that they're in train of writing and to uh, try to encourage other people to contribute to their proposal and help improve the proposal in train as it's going forward towards being funded. This is a really innovative concept. 
and one that I think is very much in line with this fourth age of, of research that uh, Jonathan wrote about last year. The outcome of this project is to actually make the whole uh, aspect of research, right from proposal all the way through to producing the research and publishing the outputs, much more collaborative. You can set up this system in such a way that you're not allowed to post your own proposal until you've actually contributed to other people's proposals and helped them improve them to get forward, uh, to get more successful funding. So this helps us raise the bar and improve the overall uh, capacity of people to um, make better proposals. But again, in order to set something up like this, we have to actually be able to have trust in the people who are um, claiming to, to make a contribution to our work. We have to have an authentication system which allows us to allow people to collaborate across institutions, across countries potentially, uh, in order to have confidence in what's being put forward. One of the other great aspects here is that over the last decade, we've seen research information management systems start to come of age. And the quality and complexity of the data that we can now represent and handle is of considerable value to an institution. And it's of a considerable value in a very particular way. Research information management systems, when well designed, allow researchers to interact with their data and enjoy working with their data, dare I say it, uh, in, a, in an efficient way, and a way that gives them value back for themselves. It should basically be asking them very simple questions in order that they can give simple responses to validate the quality of the data that we're looking for. In achieving that new bar of data quality, we can actually start asking more tricky questions. This is uh, an article which, we, uh, well, a special issue of Nature that appeared last year, entirely concerned with impact. And the impact of research is clearly a much more technically challenging subject to address. In order to really assess impact and look at pathways to impact, to understand how a piece of research done 15 years ago led to a patent or uh, led to a clinical trial, which then led to a drug discovery, which then led to a monetization and commercialization of a drug, which impacted lives, impacted public policy, impacted society, is a much, much more challenging task. And it's one that we're currently involved with in the UK. This year will be the first uh, national level impact assessment as part of the Research Excellence Framework that allows us to um, HEFKE, our funding body, to uh, give funds to universities. The level of data required to actually track the impacts from the research publication all the way to the societal or economic or political impact that the research had is an order of magnitude more difficult than what we might now think of as the simple stuff around people, publications and institutions. But those three uh, fundamental identifiers still underlie all of this. So just to, to wrap it up, uh, I think that institutional identifiers are key to us and those have been around for a while. Um, in identifiers around uh, papers are now well taken up with DOIs. The missing piece of the puzzle is really around um, personal identifiers and ensuring that they're correctly associated with work. From an open linked data perspective, uh, systems like Vivo and Profiles RNS from Harvard make a really significant contribution in terms of being able to broadcast those identifiers and give both institutions and academics real value for having taken the time to curate them. I believe that systems based in institutions such as Vivo, such as Profiles RNS, allow us to have that institutional authentication or assertion authority that allows us to trust the data that have been put out. Philip makes an imp interesting point in his uh, presentation at the end about the fact that there's no one system which does this, and that's absolutely right. 
Orchid is making a valiant attempt to draw a lot of these things together. Scopus identifiers can be pulled into Orchid, researcherid.com identifiers as well, and other systems will become co uh, compatible with Orchid to make it into an interesting um, place to find identifiers associated with people. But at the end of the day, we still need to be able to have those identifiers tied to an institution as an authority so that we know what to trust. And in the world of linked open data, we actually don't mind the fact that people have multiple identifiers. What we need is authenticating authorities that allow us to judge what level of confidence we place on the information that we're being transmitted. So authentication is, uh, sorry, identifiers are really at the center of allowing us to authenticate, validate, and deduplicate people. There's always going to be an academic push against deduplication. Some academics really won't want to be deduplicated. Uh, and this was a, a matter of considerable discussion during the, the research that we've been doing over the last 18 months or so. So I certainly recommend that people read some of the parts of the report, some of the case studies, and look in some detail at some of the recommendations we have around to handle the more challenging aspects of this area. And with that, I'd like to pass back to Karen. Yes. Thank you, Daniel. So this is our time. We left a lot of time for questions or discussion among the attendees. Um, I am personally very pleased that uh, OCLC research can be categorized as the fourth age of research because so much of our work is, in fact, international. Um, and you'll notice that we focused a lot on the needs and requirements of identifiers in general. Um, there are a lot of other identifiers that we looked at, as uh, Daniel was saying. If you think about researchers in physics, for example, they're probably in archive and have archive identifiers. Those who have published monographs may not realize it, but they probably already have a VF identifier because it, some cataloger probably has um, entered their name in one or the other of the national authority files. Um, I think that for those of you who are actually interested, so which one should we choose? We purposely, the task group purposely did not come out as, we tried to say, stay disinterested about any particular identifier system, but if you look at the spreadsheet, which the link is in the chat room, um, we mapped um, the 20 profiles that we did for 20 different identifier systems against the functional requirements. And what which functional requirements are most important to you are going to depend on who you are, the stake, your stakeholders, what your needs are. So I would advise that people who want more um, guidance on which identifier systems might be best for you in your particular context to look at the supplementary data set. Um, and one of the key um, opportunities identified by the task group was referenced by Phil in which we really do need a third-party reconciliation service because we are going to live in a world of multiple identifiers for some time to come. Um, I've asked in the chat room if, this, if anybody has questions, but we're also very interested in any of your plans for um, assigning or implementing identifiers. Any questions? Maybe while we're waiting, Andrew, maybe you could say a bit more about have you, um, just, has the British Library come to uh, answer the question you raised about whether ISNI can, in fact, be the identifier system to supplement um, all of your NACO work? You have to unmute yourself, Andrew. Sorry, I forgot I was muted there. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is something that I believe is something we have to investigate and work on. Um, but it's something that came up. People said, you know, is, is the BL going to move away from NACO and start working with ISNI instead? And that would not be my ambition. It would be, can NACO together work with ISNI and start to see whether it can work for us and whether it can actually be that that sort of universal system that can be a kind of glue that that links other identifiers and i think that's that's just a new new perspective really that isney offers um 
I think it, it does have that potential to do a lot more than you can do working within the, the confines of the NACO file. And maybe, Laura, can you say, from a publisher perspective, have you been using it to um, make sure that the royalty payments are going to the right author? Um, <clears throat> we have not, because that is not the function of, um, of Balker. That's um, not part of our, our mandate. Um, but um, we do have a number of publishers who are interested in um, joining ISNI and using ISNIs for that express purpose. And literary agents, too, as well. Right. Well, and, of course, um, a number of the members, contributors to ISNI are, in fact, rights management agencies where it's the Correct. royalty payments that are critical, which is yes. a lot different than whether somebody's heading is correct or not in a library catalog because money mm -hmm. is involved. <laughs> right. <laughs> Follow the money. Um <laughs> It doesn't seem like we're having any questions or comments. So, well, here's one that um, a colleague asked. Um, researchers want money, impact, promotions, et cetera. So how is library involvement um, in, in, in all this? I mean, Bill, do you, you have a perspective on this? So, um, yes, interesting uh, library involvement. So I think a lot of it will depend on the library and the institution and how involved they are outside of traditional library work. As I said um, here with the CAP system, um, I think that will be extremely important for establishing those um, identifiers for faculty, which they can use to relate all of their publications and related issues such as that for promotion and tenure and whatever. Um, and interestingly enough, at least at Stanford, the CAP program has been um, put in the hands of the libraries to run and to manage. So in our case, it is uh, directly attributable and manageable by the libraries. But I think, you know, in other institutions, it really will depend and it may not be the same situation in every place. Um. Melissa, I'm seeing that there's a lot of questions sent to all attendees, but I'm not seeing any of the questions. Melissa? Yes, Karen, I don't, there aren't any questions. So I'm saying to the panelists, there are a lot of questions sent to all attendees. Can you see them? Should they be resubmitted? I can see just, um, well, it turned out to be just one question um, <clears throat> from uh, Jackie S. about ISNIs and ORCIDs. If an author has an ORCID, will this mean an ISNI can be generated automatically, or does a request have to be formally sent in? Right, um, and and the answer is is no. The um, the ISNI the yeah the ISNI is not generated automatically by registering um, for your ORCID ID. Um, there the assignment criteria are different. Um, with ORCID, all you need is an email address, but with ISNI, you <clears throat> you need to have published or are about to publish a work of some sort that can be referred to in the public domain. Now, okay, now we have a question. What is the biggest barrier that must be overcome to get identifiers and adoption of Vivo? Uh, Daniel, you're probably best able to answer that. Uh, sure. Um, I think the biggest barrier to the adoption of Vivo is really getting hold of the data in order to feed Vivo. Uh, that's certainly where um, Symplectic has come in and has helped Vivo uh, clients, colleagues at Thomson Reuters and elsewhere also have similar plans now, I believe. Um, so getting identifiers into Vivo actually is, is, is very simple once you have a feed from another structured data system. And so that's really um, the, the dichotomy, that, that's the way I see it. Vivo is an excellent system for transmitting the data, for showing it at an institutional level, but ideally you don't want to have 
uh, researchers interacting directly with Vivo for data capture. You want to do that in a separate system which is built for that data capture. And I think that's what we've seen with a lot of Vivo sites and their uptake now is that they're looking to work with other systems to feed those Vivo instances. So, uh, so Vivo can incorporate, for example, ORCIDs or ISNIs and so forth as long as one of the sources they have has those identifiers. Absolutely. Indeed, you can enter all of those things manually if you wish to, but for any academic with any significant amount of um, publications, then manual entry becomes quite onerous with, with, with indeed any system. So ideally, you want um, a system that's capable of doing some harvesting for you, um, which, is, which is one of the um, benefits to the medical community of Harvard Profiles RNS because that does link up to uh, PubMed automatically. Okay, I now see what the problem is. Apparently, there are a lot of questions addressed to all participants, um, but we, but we're as panelists, we don't see them. So it has to be sent to all attend. Melissa, I don't know how how is that, but the panelists are not seeing apparently the questions that the participants are seeing. Um, so that is really strange. All try all attendees. Um, and of course, I can't see them. I can send it to all attendees, not participants. All right. So, um, if you send Karen, it to all I can see them. Um, if you want me to read them out. <clears throat> oh, very good. Okay. Well, there's one. <laughs> there are a couple I see now. So one okay. wants to hear more from Daniel about why some more some researchers don't want to be deduplicated. <laughs> what what strategies are being formed to manage this? Uh, actually, that's a, that's a completely fascinating one. Um, I'm aware of some researchers. Uh, you'll, you'll maybe some of you will be aware of the author Ian Banks. Uh, he actually writes under two different names: Ian M. Banks and Ian Banks. Uh, Ian M. Banks, I believe, I'm probably going to get this the wrong way around. Uh, his sci-fi novels, and Ian Banks is in his normal fiction novels. And he likes to effectively create those two different personas for himself um, as an author so that he can collect works of different types with different identifiers. And there are some researchers who feel the same way. Um, I know a number of researchers who work in differing fields and who want to associate all of their work in one field with one particular identifier and there are other fields segmented into other identifiers. And typically this is to avoid confusion when going for grants so that a grant funding agency doesn't necessarily see that you have um, work in, a, in an, what you might consider an unrelated field to the, to the field behind the grant that you're applying for. So um, people like to think of themselves with particular perspectives and like to apply fil filters to themselves. And so actually having multiple identifiers is a way of doing that. Uh, in terms of strategies, you, obviously having systems that can collect multiple identifiers. Obviously for central requirements in the university, you want to collect those set, all of the identifiers associated with someone and conglomerate all of their work in one place. And as, as the researcher's employer, you don't exactly have a right to do that, but you do have perhaps more right than anyone else to ask that question. Um, I do know of particular examples with particular universities where um, researchers have actually gone out of their way to defeat systems. Uh, in one case to the extent where the researcher changes their name every few years just to make sure that they can't be uh, tracked and indeed changes their name to strange symbols and things that don't appear in the standard ASCII um, character set. So, so there's a certain length to one which one can go to, uh, to, to try and solve these problems and then there's a level to which I, th I think none of us would expect it to go. And I'm, by the researcher that changes their name on a, on a two-year time scale, I'm, I'm willing to be defeated by that as a systems manufacturer. Okay. Um, there was a question about the um, statistic, Laura, of the 220-some thousand um, assigned. Um, what percentage does that represent of the total? <clears throat> um, there are 8 million um, ISNIs assigned um, in the database, and there are a total of 18 million records in the database. Okay, so the percentage, we'll have to do the math in our heads. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was an English major. <laughs> uh, maybe 40 some percent. Um, and what's mm -hmm. the number of the relevant ISO standard? Uh, it is 27729. 2027. Say it again. 27729. Two, 27729. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Stephen Hearn. There are names needed for access which have no need to claim rights, e.g. names in genealogical studies. Is ISNI an appropriate registry for them? You know, that's an interesting question that hasn't come up to date. Um, <clears throat> it's, ISNI is not meant to solely um, be a, a rights management tool, um, although that's one of its functions. Um, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. Um, as the linked data environment evolves, um, how necessary it's going to be um, for that to happen. <clears throat> and if it is necessary, then um, we can certainly look at um, you know, revising the standard to accommodate that use case, but we just haven't been confronted with it yet in you know, practical matters. I um, add that within, within the ISNI database, there will obviously be many um, names that are not in copyright um, simply because of the right. profile of the, the library files that are already in there. And there's certainly, I mean, we're, we're all related to people, um, so <laughs> there will be plenty of folks in any family tree that will, by virtue of the fact that they've contributed to something in the public sphere, um, <clears throat> will probably have ISNIs assigned to them. Right. Then there's this question from Louise Ratis. In the library world, authority records play a key role in gaining a better understanding of the copyright term of works in our collections. I'll be interested in seeing how these discussions in managing identities aid copyright determinacy. Oh, it's from David Prochaska. I could probably pick up, uh, I could make some comments on that. Um, I didn't really cover so much about other aspects around copyright, but um, certainly in the UK, we're actively engaged with, um, well, we're having discussions with the, the Linked Content Coalition and the, the local manifestation of that is the UK's um, UK Copyright Hub. And they are looking at setting up um, within the UK an identifier hub in which they see ISNI as being one of the key um, personal identifiers that they will need as a cornerstone of the system. But they also want to have lots of works identifiers across all repertoires, not just books, but uh, music and performance and and recordings, etc. So. We're sort of currently exploring with them what role the BL might have. Um, another area in which we're supporting copyright and rights clearance is through the Arrow project. Um, ISNIs have been loaded into the European Library, um, which is a collaborative um, uh, collection of bibliographic data from multiple European national libraries. And also linked in with that uh, is data from rights organizations. And it was actually um, IFRO, um, the International Federation of uh, um, Reproduction, um, Brief Reproduction Rights Organizations for Text, who funded um, getting the load of ISNIs into the TEL system because they saw a direct interest in, in using it for as part of the Arrow project for when you look up and see what, you know, is being used in sort of digitized materials, are there rights associated with it, and can we actually have a, a link from an ISNI that's in the library record to ISNIs that are in the, the various rights RMO agencies. So if somebody is still in copyright and they're being managed by an RMO, then you would actually get a link um, directly through the ISNI to say, yes, this person has got copyright invested in it. Um, similarly, things like dates, et cetera, can show that um, people are out of copyright. And now uh, we have, I'm starting to see all the other questions. Um, there were a lot that, I'm sorry, the panelists like, and, like me did not see. Um, what about um, individual, do individual researchers see much benefit from these identifiers? Are there articles cited more frequently, or is this largely for cataloging purposes? 
Um, I can make a quick comment about that. I think anybody who uh, is interested in trying to make their work more discoverable and consequently more citable um, identifiers can help you. Uh, I think the problem that we have right now is that researchers are being asked by institutions to engage at one level and institutions are typically engaging with ORCID right now. Um, that's certainly what I'm hearing in the, in the marketplace. Um, but at the same time, there are offerings such as um, ResearchGate and Academia.edu and you know any number of, of social networking systems. And researchers feel most compelled to engage with these uh, in order to ensure that their work is visible. Uh, and at the same time, few of those systems have actually chosen to engage with ORCID or ISNI or VF as a route to either automatically propagating data into profiles or indeed be, being the identifier that's being propagated around the, the, the system. So I actually think there's a great deal of confusion with, with researchers because there are so many different systems that they could be part of um, that it's it's actually quite a burden on researchers right now. Yes, and I think um, you bring up a good point, Daniel. If you're a physicist, you might not even care what the institution that you're affiliated with. You care about where your peers are. And if you're yeah. all an archive or a Google Scholar, you know that's where you're going to be, independent of whether the institution is promoting ORCIDs or ISNIs, et cetera. Um, is there, there's a question on, is there a single ISNI matching algorithm or many? Are there constant revisions and adjustments being made? Please describe the amount of programming resources available to ISNI. I think, Andrew, you're better suited to speaking to that since you actually do some of the quality teamwork. Yeah, well, we, we interact with the, the programmers and uh, there, there is a, a sort of lead expert on the at, at um, Leiden at OCLC who works on the algorithms but there are a number of programmers that are that have been involved in how the database has been built obviously they they come on and off as specific projects are, are being looked at in terms of assigning all of their time but we do have a um, a number of people that we, we are able to draw on at, at different times. Um, are there more than one matching algorithm? Well, it, it depends what you mean by a matching algorithm. What, what actually happens with the algorithms that are used is that there are a suite of different matching criteria, and these can be flexed and changed for specific data sets. But on the whole, you know, it's one sort of build up and, and progression of revisions and adjustments that improve um, a set of matching criteria and and that is something that there there are revisions all the time as a result of the work of uh, interaction between the quality team looking at what the results are and the the matching algorithms being tested and designed at at OCLC um, and the assignment system also related to ISNI, two or three institutions don't seem to be very many to do the maintenance needed for ISNI. How do you see ISNI increasing its capacity in this area? Uh, we need more members. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we just do need more members, and we do need more registration agencies. Um, and we, you know, we're quite flexible. We do have a number of people that are joining now. And there are sort of conversations going with um, outside the research sector to, to other sectors. So in the music industry and in the audiovisual industry, there are conversations there where we'll be expanding membership. So, I mean, and that is one of the things from, from the library perspective is that, you know, we are not sort of focused only on researchers and, and the big problems that they give us that, that I was trying to illustrate with the size of um, our table of content services. Um, it is all kinds of repertoires of, of creations that are collected by libraries, so so the coverage does need to be to be universal. And I, I think it's uh, well. I think that's, that's probably all I want to say about on on this topic. Well, one last question: Have there been any privacy issues raised by researchers or faculty with regard to publishing personal information? 
On the ISNI side, it hasn't been um, researchers or faculty so much as it's been performers whose jobs depend on being perceived as being of a certain age or, you know, not old, <laughs> particularly uh, women actresses or, act yeah, uh, that's redundant. But um, just, uh, you know, they don't want their birth dates publicized because, of course, the competition for roles is very, very intense. Right. And, and we get that also um, in the Virtual International Authority file um, mm -hmm. where, you know, it might be from one national authority file that has the dates and others don't, but we do suppress state information when requested. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, that, it's the same principle. <clears throat> all right, um, I think I finally got through all of the questions that were submitted that we didn't see before. So I apologize to the attendees. If we missed any, we will respond by email.